So hello everyone and welcome to this afternoon's webinar on the University of Liverpool's healthcare leadership programme. So my name is Ben Piper and I work in the marketing team. I'm going to hand over shortly to Jennifer Johnson and Susan Buttress, the programme directors, who are presenting today's webinar joined by Stephen Livesey, our Director of Learning Technology, and Joe Shaw from our admissions team. So the session is being recorded and the recording will be shared with everyone who registered uh, for this event after um, we've finished the, the event and later shared publicly on our YouTube account. So there'll be a chance for you to see this um, webinar again as a recording. For those who haven't attended a Zoom webinar before, you can ask questions during the session by clicking on the Q&A button that you will see towards the bottom of your screen. You can also use the chat feature to uh, type your questions in as well. So we will go through and answer any questions you have at the end of the session, but do please feel free to ask them as we go along. So you can use either the Q&A button or, or the chat to do that, and we'll try to review and answer all of those questions at the end of the session. So I'm now going to hand you over to Jennifer and start the session, and Jennifer is going to talk through the agenda and give you a bit of an overview to the management school. So Jennifer, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it really is um, wonderful to be welcoming you all today and to be hearing about what's going to be happening with the new programme that we'll be launching. We've just launched now in January and we're now onto the second intake in April. So we'll be giving some, some examples of experience now as well, having started this programme. The actual um, agenda we'll be talking about is how we've worked with the medical school, with the School of Medicine and the management school, and together we've worked to create this MSc in healthcare leadership for you. We'll be talking about the programme in quite a lot of detail, answering any questions and queries you've got. Um, please do fill that chat box. We look forward to helping you and answering those questions, working through the VLE and explaining that with you, talking about admissions and enrolment, and then dealing with any questions at the end. So please do populate that question box and we look forward to being able to answer those during the course of the end of our time. Thank you. Um, this gives you an overview of the university, the kind of numbers that we're dealing with, the fact that we have so many staff, over 6,000 staff, student population, and also that ability to work online. And we've got a great experience there in terms of dealing with online students and being very successful at working in the online arena. With the original Red Brick University, founded back in 1881, a Russell Group University, and associated with nine Nobel laureates. So the name of the university, as I'm sure you know, is very highly regarded on a world stage. And we're deemed to be in the top 200, ranked in that top 200, of universities worldwide. So you're certainly in good company being with us. What I'm going to do now is give you a small overview, if you like, of the University of Liverpool Management School so you can understand a bit about us and why it's important that you are working with us as well as the medical school and how we are working together in this symbiotic way to create this, this MSc in healthcare leadership. We're triple crown accredited, so AACSB, AMBER, and Equus. And to give you an idea there, the Equus only accredits 2% of business schools globally. So we are very much in that noble elite, if you like, of management schools on the global stage. We are a leading centre of excellence for management education and also research, and those two work very closely together. So our education is very much research focus. We're drawing upon the research that we do as a management school and leading that into our teaching. And the two work very closely together indeed. We have truly outstanding links with businesses and public sector organizations. And Susan Buttress will talk through some of those examples in relation to the trusts that we have and the relationships we have with um, international and national NHS organizations. Thank you. Now we look to make a difference from an enterprising and vibrant world city of culture. And I hope one day you come and see our management school. That would be great if you could. Um, and certainly if you graduate further down the line, we'd love to welcome you. That's our management school building there, one part of it. Um, and our aim is, yes, we are based in a very vibrant city. I don't know if you've been to Liverpool at all, but it's, it's, it really is a city of culture. It was a world city of culture, European city of culture. Um, it's very vibrant and it's a, a, an out, out sort of outward looking uh, city. And we work with that enterprising um, standpoint and we work with that global view. So our vista is always not just myopic and inward looking, but very much an outward looking vista.
Now our mission is that we share the University of Liverpool's mission to be dedicated to the advancement of learning and ennoblement of life. And we have so many examples, both from the management school and from the medical school, of where we don't just teach people to learn, but we enable them to really have this, this ennoblement of life. So many examples of where it isn't learning per se, but very much enriching you as an individual and helping to develop you to become a really very strong um, force, we would hope, within the field of healthcare leadership in this instance. And we advance that mission through our vision to be globally connected management school, whose transformative research and teaching places us at the forefront of intellectual and influential knowledge leadership. So we're looking to bring together, as I said before, that research and that teaching and ensure that the two work together hand in hand, bringing us the students, business and society together and learning to make a difference. So as you can see there, it's about everyone working together. It will be about you as students, the wider society in which we live in this sense, a global society, obviously, and then the healthcare organisation in which you sit. And our first cohort who began in January, we've met um, a group of them already, and it's been very exciting to hear about how they are learning about each other's cultures, the way they're living, the way that their healthcare systems are working, and indeed the different roles that they're occupying within healthcare settings. So that's almost a sense of very much what we're seeking to do to advance through our vision here within the management school. So we welcome you to the School of Medicine at the University of Liverpool. So established in 1834, the Liverpool uh, School of Medicine has been at the forefront of medical practice and research for over 100 years. And with a great number of medical pioneers, um, Liverpool has had a, a long history really of teaching and practicing excellence in medical care. And with the first um, the number of pioneers, the first surgical surgeon, woman surgeon emanated from Liverpool, and we have major contributions um, to medicine, such as the Hugh um, Owen Thomas, who invented the Thomas Splint, um, and was renowned across the world for treating trauma cases. In fact, in the World War I was responsible um, for 60% reduction in mortality uh, because of this invention. And so we work closely in this program with our NHS colleagues in the many centres of excellence in the region. So here are a number of pictures of the various buildings of the various centres. This makes our program authentic and really kind of true to life. Um, and then allows us to present life cases in healthcare leadership. The centres in the region include the Liverpool Heart and Chest Hospital, the Alderhey Children's Hospital, which is the um, photograph at the bottom. They look like large H's, don't they? It's quite an interesting building, um, but world-renowned. Uh, and the Walton Centre, which is the UK's only specialist hospital trust de dedicated to neurological services. And just across the road from the School of Medicine, which is in Cedar House. There's also the Royal Liverpool Hospital and the new Clatterbridge Cancer Care Centre, um, which is really just opened this year. So we work to create programmes that really meet the needs of our students and provide programmes that have real cases across different healthcare sectors and organisations. And this makes our programmes more authentic and allows you to apply this to your own job roles, whichever health organisation or whichever part of the, the world that you're in. We feel it's important to have a global health context all across the programme, uh, as we can all live from each other. And we really look forward to hearing some of your um, cases uh, that you can share with others within the cohort. And of course, as working with the School of Management, within the University of Liverpool, allows us to really develop a unique programme of excellence. And we believe one of it's only one of its kind in the country. So why choose the MSc in healthcare leadership? So it's a qualification from a highly ranked, prestigious Russell Group University. The structure of the programme is designed to build skills for you for the workplace and an opportunity to really apply it to your own role, 
and own position wherever you are in the world. So we want to give you the leader, um, the skills to lead proactively, to instill those skills of real reflection uh, and make you a confident leader. And as well as enabling you to make really effective decisions using a pragmatic and evidence-based approach. And we feel this is, Jenny and I feel this is really important. So it's an opportunity for you to benefit from both a high caliber management and business school um, with its leading awards and experts, and also the excellence from the health and life sciences and a renowned medical school, together with all the clinical and managerial um, expertise from around the region. Okay, so these are the program modules. So at the end of the program, we'll start at the end of the program first, you'll have an independent work-based project or dissertation. And this allows you to take an area of interest and to expand it to really um, work that for you, for you personally, but also within your role. The taught modules also cover a whole range of skills in leadership from the basics of understanding leadership to the teaching of teams in your organization, leading change and innovation to really important areas such as quality management and safety in really kind of driving self, um, safe healthcare. And of course, important, also important is finance. Thank you. And, and as you saw there, there are different types of awards that are available to you to study. Um, the MSc Healthcare Leadership, which includes all of the modules that you've just seen there, the Postgraduate Diploma, Certificate and Award, and that prior slide split out which individual modules were on which aspects and which awards, so you can have a look at that at later date if you want to. So what will you learn? You'll certainly learn about what it's like to be an innovative leader, making sure that you are aware of many of the thoughts of what's happening at the forefront of leadership practice. So you, we'll be teaching you appropriate leadership skills, very much um, robust skills, but considering how to lead in this world in which we live, which is obviously ever changing, ever moving. We'll be definitely introducing you to key contemporary issues within changing healthcare contexts. And one of the benefits, I think, of being on a programme such as this, which is a global programme, is you will not be teaching, not be thinking about just about your own healthcare context, but about different situations in different parts of the world, very much feeding into considering healthcare in a global rather than a, a localised vista. And that helps you to then apply leadership theory to healthcare settings. You won't just be um, considering examining the, the setting in which you're sitting yourself, but thinking on a far more strategic um, and global basis and applying theory, thinking about how leadership theory can apply definitively to healthcare settings. And we'll be introducing you to various different ideas from both private setting, public sector, um, and also international perspectives. So there won't be just one way of viewing this particular aspect of healthcare. We'll be thinking about it on a far, far wider stage than just one type of healthcare that might exist. And indeed, in our, in our program development, we are bringing in cases from different parts of the world to ensure that we are not just looking at this from, say, UK perspective, because we certainly are not. Thank you. I think it's important to say as well that one of the benefits of doing an MSc, and I saw that question there about MSc or MBA, we can talk about that a bit more later maybe, but the, one of the benefits of studying at master's level is that you're not just developing your career, and we, we do believe that you will develop your career. There's no question that as you develop skills, as you have this understanding of self and of leadership, you are more likely to gain promotions, we'd hope, and certainly develop your career and think about where you want to go. So there will be some introspection, there will be some reflexive learning, and the reflexivity is built in, into what we're calling a learning passport. So from about module three, you'll be working on developing a real sense of reflection and reflexivity about who you are as a character and how you are developing within your own individual career setting. 
and we do appreciate that there will be diverse healthcare systems. And what we found already in our first action learning sets, which we've been running in module one, is that individuals are commenting on the difference and how they are learning and creating very new networks of relationships in different parts of the world. And indeed, Susan and I really, really enjoyed meeting this current cohort and learning from them and how they're enjoying the experience of being on the Masters already, they've just started in January. We'll bring you access to guest, guest speakers from a healthcare field, um, and we'll be recording some of those and making sure that you have access to, to looking at those, in, th those individuals and hearing what they have to say. Um, they tend to be specialists who have either researched within healthcare itself or indeed who have worked in a healthcare setting um, as well. We're going to engage you with work-based issues within the healthcare arena and the assignments that we've designed are very wide ranging. They're not just focused on your own place of work, but it's far, far bigger and more strategic, more, less tactical, if you like, way of looking at leadership. We're very much focused on authentic assessment. So there'll be some times that you'll be working with teams and creating uh, perhaps a team video working together and that might be part of your assessment. Other times you might be writing reflective log, which is part of an assessment or indeed doing assignments and more traditional sort of educational assignments as well. But we have designed it so that what you're doing is meaningful. It's about developing you as a character and as an individual. And it's also about sitting back and making sure that you are helping to develop the organization in which you are working currently. So we imagine and we, we do believe actually that you will make a difference as you start developing your skills and your knowledge through this particular course. And career wise, we know that people will go into maybe stay within their own healthcare organisation or maybe go beyond that. They might want to work for governing bodies, community organisations. And we do see people typically working at national and indeed, indeed international levels. We could give you many examples from the management school of people who are working very nationally and indeed internationally um, post their qualifications with us. I'll now pass you on to Stephen, I think, to look at the VLE. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Stephen Lindsay. Directive of Learning Technology. Um, and this part of the session, I'm going to go through the learning platform from a student's perspective. So everything you see is, is from the view that a student would see it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how the platform works um, and then I'll actually go into the first module on this program, just to give you an idea about um, how we present content and how you engage with the content and actually with each other um, through the VLE. The first thing to note is it's, it's one central learning environment um, and you'll access everything you need for the program through the platform. There are other platforms that plug into this environment. So for example, you'll not only have access to this um, VLE, but you'll also have access to the um, resources, um, for example, the online library at the university, and a number of resources which plug in um, to that suite of services, all through one set of credentials. So there's a nice or seamless integration between the services you need. But essentially, you'll get to them all through the, the VLE, so it's nice and um, uh, efficient for students to work through. Also, everything I go through here is all um, mobile responsive, so you can access on your tablet, on your mobile phone, laptop, um, and so on. So again, the VLE is designed to be easy to use. Um, you should be able to get to your modules and get to your content um, really quickly um, and easily. Before I move around the platform, I'll just talk a little bit about the support that you also get as part of your programme. Um, so behind the scenes, or what sits alongside the programme are our student services um, um, departments. And I'll, I'll just go into the student services page here. The student service is really important because these teams will help you throughout your um, programme. So there's a dedicated student support team. There are there's a study skills team, study skills resources. Um, there's also some support on student welfare student experience, so careers advice, all, all these kind of things. So they sit alongside all the um, academic content and academic support that you'll, you'll get as well. Um, okay, so I'll go into uh, this student's demo student's dashboard. Um, and to do so, we'll just click on the little um, get started button here. Um, now each student has their own personalized dashboard. So you'll only see resources that are relevant to your um, program of study. Um, so this demo student is tied to um, three or four modules here, but as you progress through your program, you'll be tied to, to those um, modules as you work through. Um, not only do you get access to your um, taught modules here, before you start your program, you'll also have access to an induction. So for the first two weeks of the program, you'll have access to an induction module, and that'll just help you become familiar with the learning platform, 
um, with some of the academic skills that you'll you'll need to perhaps brush up on before that first taught module. So that's a really useful resource um, as an introduction um, to the to the program. But for now, I'll go into the first taught module, and that's um, this um, understanding leadership module here. And um, we try and keep the design nice and, and simple. So um, I'll, I'll go through some of the features in a second, but you'll see that um, on the left-hand side, we have the, the, the navigation draw. And it's consistent from one module to the next. So although the module content will change and um, the resources will change, the structure will remain consistent. That become, hopefully means you become familiar with how to access certain resources. So for example, we've landed here on the, the module homepage. And in the center, we've got some introductory text, we've got some learning outcomes um, and a bit of an overview of, of what to expect over the, um, over the next eight weeks. The modules um, are split up into weeks and this first one is, is eight weeks long and you can access the content for each of these weeks um, through the development page here on the left. And I'll, I'll jump into that in, in just a second. But before I do that, I'll go into some of these top pages here, which again are, are fairly generic across um, most modules. So for example, every module has a schedule so there's a start and end date to the whole module. And then within the module is a series of milestones and deadlines. Um, and that's where these, these dates and times will be um, displayed to you. You also have access to your own um, personalized calendar. So uh, these dates also pop your, uh, populate your um, VLE calendar and you can export that calendar and put it into your own you know, Outlook or Gmail, whichever calendar you use. So you can keep up to date and um, so you don't miss those key, key deadlines throughout, throughout the module. The next page is the lecturer office. Now every taught module is supported by um, a lecturer and really the role of the lecturer is to provide um, any academic support that you might have throughout that taught module. So here, this is just obviously demo credentials, but you'd see a real um, profile picture for your lecture, some real contact details and biography and so on. But maybe your, your, your first point of, point of call for um, any academic queries. If you had a question about, um, maybe something more program related, maybe about paying your fees or um, if you needed to take a short break or you weren't sure what the next module was, that's when you go to the student services department and the student support team um, and they'd be on hand to, to answer any questions. You can contact that support team via email, telephone. We also have on the platform um, live chat. So you can actually chat directly with that student support team straight through the learning platform. Um, and they'll be able to get back to you straight away through that channel. So that's a really good um, channel for getting, you know, really quick response on any, any student support queries you might have. Um, so yeah, there's a lecturer office. Uh, in this module, there's a learning journal. So I'm not gonna go into every page on, on this particular sec section because I'm quite keen to get some, to some content, but you'll see that there are a, a additional resources um, presented here. So for example, Within a couple of clicks, you can get to the grading criteria. This is quite an important page. This content may not be um, tied to a specific week of study, but it might be resources that wrap around the whole module. So for example, in the grading criteria page, I can see the weighting for the assessed components. And if I click through to these pages, it'll show me the grading criteria for each one. It's quite an important page. And again, it's always in the same place. So you'll um, hopefully become quite familiar with, with how to um, access those resources. So what I will do is I'll go into a week of study and I'll show you what this um, what week might look like. Um, so we break the weeks up. Uh, so each week has a particular topic. Again, there's some introductory text for, um, for what you're going to be covering this week and some learning outcomes. And then as I scroll down the page, we're, we're introduced to a series of activities for the week. Uh, and these will vary. Um, and that, um, that's on purpose. You know, we want to um, introduce you to a variety of activities through different um, um, forms of, of media. So for example, there may be some lecture casts. Um, a lecture cast, if I load this one up, is um, our, our version of, a, of an online lecture, if you like. So um, instead of uh, a traditional lecture where you may you know, sit in a lecture theatre and a, someone will, will, will talk for an hour um, going through some content, we try and break that up into, into smaller pieces of media. Um, and it, it just provides a more flexible way to work through that content. So instead of one big long piece of video, we, we break that content up and, and chunk it up um, and also provide activities um, throughout. So in this lecture cast, it's actually saved where I was up to. But if I go to the home page, you can see the first time you come in here, it'll give you some 
aims for the lecture cast. You can see I've come in before as a demo student, so it'll save where you're up to as well. So it could be that you watch the first two pages and then on the third video, you think, oh, now, you know, now I have to go to work or now I'll just pause and come back and you come back to these pages. Um, and then within these pages, there's a, there's a variety of media itself. So if I go to um, this page, you should be able to see a piece of video. I'm just going to mute that. I'm not sure if you can hear the audio there, but there's an audio narration going through this video. Um, and how we present the content really depends on, on what it's about. It may be that we use animation. It may be simple text on the screen. Um, it just depends what the content's about. The point is really that it's, it's visually, it's engaging. Um, the length you'll see, this particular video clip is only a few minutes long, but as we work through the content, there'll be additional resources to go through. So really it's variety in, in um, presenting this content to, to you as a student to, to keep you engaged with, um, with the material. So that's a quick example of a, of a lecture cast. So if I uh, come out of that page and go back to the platform, you can see in week one, um, there are actually two lecture casts and you can also monitor your completion in these activities. So I can tick off activities as I, as I work through them. Or if it was an assessed activity, once I've got a grade, then um, it would be marked as, as complete. Um, each week there may be resources such as uh, you'd expect to see a reading list. So again, here we've got some directed reading for the week. And again, because we integrate really closely between the VLE and the online library, what we're able to do is um, point you directly to that reading list on the library um, pages. Again, using the same set of credentials. So you don't need a load of different login details. It's just one set to get to um, all the resources you'd need. So it's a reading list this week. And if I go back to week one, uh, there's also a discussion forum this week. So here, if I click into the forum, um, there's a prompt there for me to, to follow as a student. And uh, I simply um, respond to that prompt, add, add a subject, add a message. And this really is where you, you know, you'll start to collaborate and learn together as a, as a group of students, drawing in that, that international perspective, different international perspectives um, through the learning platform, through activities like um, discussion forums. And again, each module um, may be different. There may be forums, maybe group work activities, um, but we really encourage that collaborative um, element of, of learning together um, through the module. So you'll simply work through the, the content. If I go into week two, you'll see it'll look fairly similar. So you'll, you'll know what's expected of you each week, but it may be that the activities have changed. So here we've got obviously a different lecture cast. And this time actually the forum falls off the, off the back of the lecture there. We have some reading. And in this module, there are action learning sets. Actually, these are um, grouped activities um, that the lecturer will, will facilitate. So a variety of activities, um, very engaging, um, uh, and they, they invite collaboration from, from students to, um, to work together. So hopefully that gives you an insight into what the platform looks like, how you would use the, the VLE to, to work through your, um, your modules. I'm happy to take questions as, as we go. But for now, I'll, I'll um, stop sharing my screen and I'll hand over to my colleague, Joe, who's going to discuss the um, admissions process. Um, hi, everyone. Yep, so I work on the admissions team and I'm going to talk through the whole admissions and the enrollment process as well for our online programs. So we're starting on our first slide here and you can see a simple step-by-step -step process of the the whole enrollment and admissions and how it works for the Liverpool's online programs. And um, so really starting at the beginning, um, you're interested in one of our programs, so what would the first step be? So really the, the best first step I would recommend is getting in contact with our admissions team. And you can do that through a number of different ways. So you could either send us an email through our general address, you could uh, contact us through the phone. And um, the best one I would advise is to complete an inquiry form. So you can do that on our website on each of the programme pages. You just fill your details in and they get sent through to our admissions team who will then um, actively contact you and discuss, you know, any questions that you may have, um, any further bits of information that you want about the programmes. And then from that kind of step one, you'll be assigned a personal admissions advisor who will then work with you all the way through the um, admissions process. So um, you'll always have you know, a good first point of contact um, to help you along the way. Um, so moving on to the second step, um, you've got all the information that you need and you're then ready to actually go and make an application for one of our programs. So what you need to do, um, you directly apply to us. So you don't go through any kind of third party like UCAS, um, it's just directly through the University of Liverpool. 
All you would need to do is complete a free online application form, um, which again, you can find on our website. Uh, you fill out your details as usual and attach all the required documents needed for an application as well. As you can see there, that the, it is completely free to apply as well. So we won't ask for any um, admissions fees or anything like that. Once we have an application from you and all of your documents as well, we're able to then get your application reviewed. So that'll be reviewed um, by a senior admissions members of staff and the director of studies as well. Once your application has been reviewed, then we will do what's called a pre-enrollment review. So this is simply just a very short tele um, telephone conversation, 10, 15 minutes or so, as it says there. And what we'll do in that uh, phone call is we'll just make sure that you're aware of the commitments to study, um, some further information about the enrollment process, and just really make sure that you've got everything that you need um, in preparation for starting your studies with us. Uh, once you finish that review, then we can send you your official offer letter from the university. And then it would just be up to you to officially accept your offer and pay your deposit as well. And then you'll be all um, good to go and enrolled on the programme. Okay, so I talked about the entry requirements for our healthcare leadership programme. Um, so applicants uh, would need to satisfy these entry requirements as detailed. So we would really be looking for a minimum of a 2-1 classification degree in a relevant subject area, which is equivalent to a UK's bachelor's degree. And this would need to be coupled with at least two years of relevant professional experience in a healthcare related setting as well. And if you're ever unsure about um, the entry requirements or you know where you fall into those entry requirements, that's what the admissions team is really here for. You know, we're more than happy to have discussions with you, talk about your background, um, academic and professional experience, and see if this is the right program for you and where you fall within these requirements. So we, like I say, we're more than happy to talk through all this with you. Um, individually as well, if you have any further questions. We're just adding on to that as well, and um, we do have an alternative entry route. So for those candidates who um, you know, maybe don't have any academic qualifications, have just been working all of their career, then we do have a professional work experience route as well. Um, so we can accept you based on um, your professional experience um, instead of just um, academic as you know detailed in the other requirements so that's an opportunity for those of you who you know may not have been to university um, or don't have a bachelor's degree um, so you fall under that bracket as it mentions at the bottom there as well and um, all applicants that need to would need to have reached a minimum required standard of English language as well and providing evidence of that is part of the um, application process as well um, again, we do accept quite a wide variety of English language certificates. So um, again, the admissions team is happy to talk through this with you as well in terms of what certificates we accept and the kind of individual requirements as well. And um, so our tuition fees, and um, we have you know individual fees for each of the awards that you can study on the programme. So starting from the bottom, working our way up, you can see that the postgraduate award would be £3,000, certificate 6000 diploma 12000 and then the full MSc would be 18,000. And they have a net fees um, of any sales tax rates which are payable to you um, in your country of residence. And um, again, we can talk about that during the application process as well. But you can see um, quite clearly on the screen there, there'll be the individual prices for each of the awards. And um, so we've got a few different payment methods available. So um, the first point, um, for the April 2021 20, intake, we are currently offering a scholarship of 15% to all students um, studying this particular program. Um, I believe that's for the certificate, the diploma and the full MSc. Um, the good news is that there's nothing you need to do. So all students are eligible. You don't need to fill out um, a scholarship application form or anything like that. We will just automatically make that reduction for you on your payment plan when you get an offer letter from us. Um, so yeah, nothing, no work for you there. We'll reduce that for you. And for students who are living in England, um, you would also be eligible for a student postgraduate loan from Student Finance England. Um, that is for students who are studying the full MSc only. Um, you'll be able to get part of your fees funded through Student Finance England. Also quite helpful as well is that we um, offer a monthly payment plan option. So if you weren't in a position to pay all the fees up front in one go, um, you're more than welcome to pay in equal monthly installments throughout the duration of your programme to really split up those fees and you know make the payments um, a lot more manageable. 
And finally, to finish off this slide, you can see that we have a 21 day money back guarantee if you decide that the program isn't for you. So that starts from the day that you start the program within those first weeks. If you just, you know, it's not really for you, you get a full refund of your deposit there as well. Um, so if you are ready to go ahead and make an application, um, there's a link to the online application form that I mentioned earlier. So you can follow that link um, or you can just go on the online programs website and it's right at the top of the page um, for you to click on and complete online. And when you come to make an application, it's really useful if you try to submit as many documents as possible um, so we can you know, process that quicker for you. And we have a short list of the documents here. So um, simply you know, we need a copy of photograph ID. So this could be a passport or a driver's license. We would need um, an update CV as well. Copies of your educational certificates. So they would be scanned or photograph copies of your degree certificate and the transcripts as well. We would need um, a short personal statement of around 300 to 500 words or so detailing you know, why you want to study the programme, a bit about your experience and where this programme could potentially take you in the future. We'd also require a letter of recommendation. So this can come from someone you've worked with academically, um, a tutor, dissertation supervisor, for example, or someone um, who you directly report to in your workplace. So, you know, manager or supervisor, someone within that role who can write you a letter of recommendation. And as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, we'd also need evidence of English language proficiency as well. But just to kind of reiterate, you know, um, if you have any questions about these documents or run into some difficulties, again, like I say, your personal admissions advisor is really here to help you along this process. So we can help you with those documents and really just clarify what you need for your application. And um, so just kind of, um, again, reiterate, the admissions team can be contacted through the first link on the slide there. And um, so you can email us, you can give us a phone call or complete the inquiry form and we'll get in touch with you and discuss any questions that you have about the program or the application process. And um, that's really what we're here to help with. And um, again, there's the link to the application form there. And um, you should really be applying um, in March for starting in April. So we have an enrollment deadline on the 30th of March. And that enrollment deadline, um, as mentioned on my first slide, all of those steps of the application process would need to be completed by that date. So if you are wanting to start in that April intake, um, I would be you know, saying to apply and send all documents um, a good few days before the 30th of March, just so we can get you through the process in time for starting. But um, those students that um, get there for the enrollment deadline, we look forward to seeing you on the 6th of April for our April start date. That's great. Thank you for that, Joe. We'll go to any questions at this point. If anyone does have any questions, if you would like to put those into the chat or into the, the Q&A, you should see a Q&A button towards the bottom of your screen. So feel free at this point to put any questions either in the Q&A or the chat. We have got a couple of questions I can see in the chat um, already, Jennifer and Susan. Um, a question is coming from, from Jay um, asking if we could maybe speak a little bit more about the MSc versus an MBA, perhaps what perhaps the differences are between those two types of, of program. And Susan, you're on mute if you're trying yeah, to Yeah, I think it's probably a good one for Jenny um, from, the, from the School of Management to answer. Yeah, thank you. It's interesting that, isn't it? What, what we did when we first did the research, thinking about healthcare leadership and looking at the programme, we did a vista across various different parts um, of offer, offerings, if you like, looking at MBAs and looking at the MSCs. And what the MBAs tend to do is give you um, a flavour of marketing, maybe finance, um, HR, different types of um, different disciplines, if you like, within a, a small area of, of um, sort of expertise, if you like, focused in for each of those individual parts of study. What I would suggest is within our MSc in healthcare leadership, what we've done is incorporated some of those ideas, interesting enough, from the MBA um, of taking. So, for instance, we've got a finance component. We have we have an, an, an HR module. So we have we have used that idea of taking different disciplines and, and, and bringing them together and working with the medical school. They've created three of the individual modules, for instance, from a medical perspective. Um, and so 
and there's a co-creation of that final dissertation piece that, that Susan and I have been working on together. So there is that sense there that we, I think we are quite akin, if you like, to the MBA per se, um, but obviously we're, we're not an MBA by name. That's, that's probably what I'd add. And if there's anything else you want to say to that, Susan? Um, I suppose also, yeah, just to reiterate, uh, reiterate that it's allowed us the flexibility to really explore the healthcare element of it um, and to really facilitate putting that into your roles rather than it's, as Jenny says, the MBA being the very core areas, we've actually done a little bit of that implementation and facilitation um, for you. So it is a different product, but if you are in a healthcare management role, then perhaps we you know the, the best for you. And there's another question um, as well um, from the same person. Um, managing a global health and well-being, uh, it's a large US corporation, but do have a clinical background. Does this fit the typical student profile? Well, I should say that it's quite broad in terms of the clinical, uh, in terms of the profile for the student. Um, but certainly, yes, um, it is attracting not everyone, um, but those on our last call that we had with the students um, that are already on the programme. Um, then there were one or two that didn't have a clinical background, but most did. Um, and so we're really used to working with students like this. Um, and I think it's very appropriate for for, for you. Absolutely. And I'd add to that that, that even um, those without a clinical background are working within healthcare settings currently. So the, they, they will be learning about this from a management perspective, if you like, but not from necessarily from a clinical perspective. But we do know that, that, we, that, that from the discussion boards already, those groupings of people are working together very well. So that background that you give there, very much what we'd be wanting for from, from somebody within our student population. Very much so. Thank you. Yeah, and I think obviously you, you um, you're sharing ideas, um, and mm -hmm. so that really works well um, having both in the in the cohorts. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. Thank you. And I'm going to just remind anyone who's watching, um, so you can use obviously the, the, the chat or the uh, Q&A button at this point to ask any questions that you, you might have. And I've got a question here, um, Joe, from, um, from Arnold asking um, about the English language uh, requirements. Uh, so I live in the British Dependent Territory. Um, do I need to submit evidence of English as a standard language? Um, typically with British dependent territories, um, no, they wouldn't need to provide evidence of English language. Um, again, we can check with the application um, when one's submitted, but um, I wouldn't think you would need to submit evidence if you're from um, a dependent territory now. That's great, thank you. And this, I suppose, leads on actually to a question um, I was looking at a little bit earlier on. Um, I suppose it was kind of about different time zones. Obviously we have students on the programme from absolutely all over um, the world, very international cohorts. I suppose the question, Susan Jenny, is how has that sort of been, been factored in or, or baked into to the programme for, for students who might be studying perhaps across different time zones and the certain things that we've done on the programme to, to, to cater for that and to enable them to participate fully in, in, in the course itself? I suppose the fact that it's an online learning environment is the great starting point that really you can learn at the, the time that is best to suit to, to, to you. So we were speaking to someone and she just finished one of her clinics and she was clinical director talking to us in her car on the way back. You know, she wasn't driving, but I'll call it, you know, but she, in fact, she was able, even able to access a Zoom meeting like that from another side of the world is quite incredible. So I think there, there is that part that we are very much attuned to that. Where there is maybe working together as part of your assignments, as one of the modules needs you to work together and create teamwork, we will be doing that within a geographical region to try to make sure that those people are not disadvantaged. And absolutely the core of all our timings is try to ensure that the, the timings are akin and attuned to every single, obviously, um, the time zone that we can, that we can do within reason. And, and we're, we're doing that on purpose to make sure that we don't disadvantage anybody in terms of time zones. I don't know if there's anything you want to add there, Susan. Um, also that obviously those that are synchronous are also recorded, um, I believe, therefore, so that if you do miss that, and it, it happens to be at a time when perhaps somebody is in a clinic or particular meeting, then um, it's there for reference. Great, thank you. Uh, and Jay asks a question, I suppose, leading on from that. Is there any opportunity for in-person interaction at the University of Liverpool? 
yes, yeah, certainly the we have instructors who and there, there are um, elements of the entire program when we're expecting you to interact with us. Uh, part, part of that interaction is through the instructor and making sure at module level you're working on a week by week basis with them. The other part of the interaction is interacting with your cohort as well through the discussion boards. So the discussion boards are monitored and indeed Susan and I can go in any time and have a look at the discussion boards and see what's being talked about and get an idea of how an individual module is running. Um, but at the same time, the module instructor themselves will be regularly looking into that discussion board and making comments to facilitate further discussion, very much guided le level, level to boards. So you shouldn't ever feel as if you are, you know, alone in your office with a with a screen. It should be a really interactive experience um, in terms of the lecturer, uh, but also in terms of your peers. So it is a real learning environment rather than you know you looking at um, at recorded material or looking at um, at the reading material. We have definitely incorporated that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, Christina asks, being done online, how flexible would it be to manage the schedule of the programme for someone who is also working? Um, can we perhaps manage personalised somewhat the, the schedule? So I suppose just to reiterate that um, it is designed for people in, in different time zones. So it's the online learning platform allows for that and um, that the there are pre-recorded re lectures and tasks that the that you know, she would be able to work through um, and also the scheduling of those synchronous lectures uh, are also at a time where she you know she should be able to be um, be able to interact with yeah, and I, suppose, and I suppose we'd reiterate there that the, the whole of the programme has been designed to be inclusive, to make sure that everyone can be included, um, regardless of their working patterns or where they're living in the world. So we have designed that with this in mind. Uh, and I think your um, current structures that Stephen was talking about before internally are very, very strong. So student support, for instance, is very strong that people can turn to if, they're, if they want um, specific help and that gives you individualised support. And indeed the individual lecture sure on each module make sure they they can support you if there's something you're struggling with um, but we're, we're there to ensure that you are able to both hold down a job if that's what you choose to do and also do this program and the examples we're finding so far say so we only launched launch in January but the, from that first cohort are that people are managing this very well and really enjoying the, the working together and also um, doing their current jobs as well. That's great, thank you. Again, I'll just remind people, feel free to use the Q&A or the um, chat at this point to ask any questions you have about the programme. Uh, another question that came in was just a little bit, I suppose, about the um, progression path and if it was possible to progress from that PG award that we saw through to the other awards and up to the full MSc. Is that something that it's possible for a student um, to, to do? Yes, and we've designed that with that in mind. Susan and I spent a lot of time sitting back and considering which of the individual modules should be involved in which part of which award, certificate, diploma. And there is a natural progression to that. So if you feel at the moment for financial reasons or other reasons that you want to start at a lower level, of, say the award, certificate, whatever, um, we fully expect you actually to continue and to complete the master's. And we know that often when people start this master's level learning, um, it, it's very exciting. And it, and it's very and it's life changing, life enhancing. Um, and there are very few people I've worked with in, in terms of student wise over the last 10 years coming to contact with who have failed to really understand and really get excited about this, this master's level learning. So our view is, yes, you can come in at any of those points, but we fully expect that whatever point you come in at, you will progress almost straight away to that next level. I don't know what you want to add there, Susan. We did talk about this a lot, didn't we, when we designed it? Yeah, and we, I think we were fully aware that it depends on the stage of your career um, and as whether you're you're destined and you, you wish to do the full master's. It may well be that you have family currently um, and you wish to take a, a small part of study um, each year and then complete the programme. So it really is flexible to meet the needs of, um, of you within your life. So that's fully possible. We designed that, the programme with that in mind so that you could access it, essentially. 
That's great, thank you. Another question we had in was just about, I suppose, the uh, assessment. I know we've touched on it a little bit um, in, in the, the webinar already, but we just expand a little bit at this point on what assessments looks like for students on, on the programme. Varied, we would say. So again, we built an assessment um, whole matrix working out. We wanted different types of assessment across different modules. Um, and we've ensured there's a real variety of assessment to make sure that, that all types of learning styles and characters are included. So it's all we, we, we begin and we finish this program with the with the view of it being inclusive, creating something that's equally accessible to, to everyone, whoever they are in any, at any stage of their lives and careers across the globe. So very much with that in mind. Um, and hence we have things, as I was talking about before, where perhaps there's, some, there's one with a, a team role where you work together as teams to create a, a, a presentation together and you have to create that online in, the, in a kind of virtual environment which is very engaging and probably quite challenging to do to bring something together where you're all happy and working together but that replicates that real world that we all live in where we're all working in teams invariably and it isn't always easy and somehow we have to pull that together so that's one thing that we've done the reflective learning log and bring, bring bringing in action learning for instance in the first module enables students and to, to work together again with different people and learning to listen and learn from them before they present their particular issues and challenges they're faced with in their working environment. So that again is that working together collaboratively in order to work out that the best solutions for you, you and indeed for your, your, your fellow students, which helps you with your learning too. So it's not just about looking at your own case and where you, you currently are sitting in, in, in a healthcare environment, it's hearing from the other cases as well and learning from them. And then we have very individual, as I say, reflective writing pieces, which are very reflexive about you as a character, you as an individual, how you're developing your skills, how you're developing your character, which is ensuring that you over time are also growing as an individual to, to have this greater, wider perspective, if you like, of the world and, and in which you sit. Is there anything specific you want to add from the medical side, Susan? Um, I would really just um, reiterate how um, how broad it is, the types of assessment that you'll be, you'll, you'll be engaging in. So, for instance, presentations, audio presentations, uh, traditional coursework, but also really reflective case studies and really bringing your own live cases into the assessment. So that should really help with progressing your current roles so you can really bring a, some of these leadership problems um, right into the assessment and study those so I think that will be a real kind of use but it's, it's very broad so that allows it to be extremely interesting I don't think I've ever known a program actually with so many different assets in terms of assessment so you certainly won't be bored with um, writing coursework writing assignments um, you'll have a whole range of um, activities to, um, you know, at the end of, of, of each module. You also mentioned guest speakers um, towards the beginning of the, of the webinar, Susan. Mm -hmm. um, what do they bring to the programme? And uh, there are sort of a number of those throughout the, 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 the course of the programme, sort of dropping in and yeah, sharing their experience. Yeah, so um, we may have guest speakers that particularly have been um, doing some research that's very relevant. Uh, so they can be obviously from the management school in addition to the medical school. But also we have a number of clinicians who are real experts in their areas, such as the you know, kind of health and safety or in quality, um, who's leading um, intensive care teams, um, coming across real kind of trauma uh, issues um, that they have to lead and uh, and so we really put those into the program as examples uh, throughout um, each, each section so hopefully some of those guest speakers will obviously add interest as well. Yeah, and, and I've just been doing some recordings, some question and answer sessions with um, a couple of guest speakers to give you an idea. So one of whom is a managing partner at Belbin Associates. So she works with Belbin team roles um, and thinks about who we are as characters and how we coexist with difference. So the fact that we are all different individuals, how can we work together cohesively and understand and respect the differences that we all have? So that was a very interesting hour. So uh, we're just, that's going to be cut soon and, and, and um, deciding on how much to use of that 
that footage to use. And another example of a Q&A, I've worked with Dr. Denise Priest and she did her um, doctoral studies in a healthcare setting, again, looking at strong leadership and, and what she learned about high performance teams within a healthcare setting. So she works in the management school um, and her research is part of that Q&A. So some of this will be pre-recorded, but in the sense that they are guest speakers and that's what we're, that's what we're calling them. And the beauty of about pre-recording is we can then edit them and make them ready for you. Um, so they are, and they're absolutely then inclusive and access to anyone regardless of time zone. So that's, that's what we're doing in relation to some of our guest speaker work. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Uh, I'll just again remind people, feel free to ask any questions uh, at this point. There's the Q&A button towards the bottom of your screen. We've also got the, the chat feature available. So please um, do put those questions in there. We're happy to answer any of those um, at this point of, of the webinar. Uh, another question, uh, perhaps just coming back to the commitment in terms of study time. Um, is there a sort of a typical amount of, of time that you would say in terms of perhaps hours a week that people might need to set aside um, for the programme. I suppose it could perhaps vary um, maybe week to week, module to module, but is there a sort of typical perhaps amount of time that somebody might need to be, be sort of thinking about factoring in if they are to, to, to join the programme? I don't know if you want me to answer this, Jenny. Um, I suppose if we're looking at the 15 credit modules, then a 15 credit module would encompass 100 in total 150 hours of work but that includes not only um, the lectures that um, you have online but also the reading the interaction the reflection um, those of you working um, you're also you're, also spending some of that time developing some of those ideas so it's really um, each week, then you'd be having a day, day and a half a week of um, spread across the week in terms of, of contributing to the to the programme. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to say, Jenny. Yeah, I mean, that that's typically spread across eight individual weeks. Um, and we do encourage you to watch the videos each week and keep up to date with that, including working on the discussion board. Um, and we have split the assignments. So for each module design, as we're talking about the modules, we're making sure that the any, any kind of assignments or, or work is split to, to give you that chance to make sure that you're, you've got time to work towards it. So um, in, in a kind of a, a basic way, you need to work towards the assignment dates to make sure that you obviously adhere to those. And that's the mo that's really important. And if, if for, for instance, one week you find that you're really struggling to keep up with lectures, everything is there for you to catch up the following week. So it's not as if you're under enormous pressure on a weekly basis, if you're finding that the work pressures are too much. Um, but that's that's typically what we'd suggest, yes. And I I'd imagine that quite a lot of those 150 hours will be going into your assignment. So that'll be often compressed hours rather than every single week. That's great, thank you. Um, so now, Stephen, you showed quite a good number of things in, in the VLE, um, things like the, the, the online library, for example. Uh, do students need to buy any additional things to be able to study with us? Is there everything sort of provided by us or do students need to buy anything uh, additional? No, all the, um, for example, all the reading materials provided for students, um, really they need um, a laptop <laughs> or a PC and connection to the internet, but all the courseware, all the materials provided through the, through the VLE, um, so there's nothing particularly they need to, um, to, to pay for for the, for the program. That's great, thank you. Again, I'll just remind people, we've still got a few minutes left. If there are any questions, please use the, the Q&A um, or, or the chat to ask those. Uh, another question we had, I suppose going back to that, that sort of career development aspect um, of the program, what kinds of careers can, can the course help prepare people for Susan and, and Jenny? Sorry, Jenny, you're on mute. Okay. We would say national and international careers. We, we expect you to ultimately be leading edges within your individual national settings. We really do, um, at the very least within your organisation, to be a leading light and to be a leader. We will give you the skills, we'll give you the knowledge, we'll give you a chance to practice that expertise in order for you to really fulfill your potential that you want to within a career setting. And for some of you, it might be that you want to continue with your current role and excel at it and be an exemplary leader. And that's fine if that's what you want to do. But what we're saying, I guess, is that you can go beyond that and we know 
many, many, many students who have who have really get themselves into very strong career prog progression within that, actually even during the masters themselves as they grow and as they develop and as their individual leaders in, at work start to see those changes within them. Anything specific you'd say, Susan? Um, we we see um, we there are a whole range of um, careers that you might um, might take off from doing the program either within your own organisation or indeed if you're thinking of actually moving organisation and using it as a stepping stone. So very much think about the masters as that opportunity. Um, I think that's really creating an opportunity for your careers and that really should be part of your thinking. Uh, I'm sure it is for those of you that are perhaps on the call and also those that are already on the program in terms of actually what am I going to, um, how is, where is this going to take me, uh, I've got these new skills um, and so I think throughout the course then your ideas uh, but also your knowledge of the roles that are out there will really be enhanced because you're doing a lot of group work with different professionals. You're not only seeing them and hearing them from the tutor perspective, you're also working in a really kind of rich environment of, of, of leaders. Um, and so I think you'll get a lot of uh, motivation from that um, to Anna, perhaps not answering your question fully, but um, I think that will also help to encapsulate some, some of that for you. And I, and I think there's something very key here that Susan and I've talked about a lot is that the clinical courses that you've attended, so those of you who maybe are a qualified doctor or dentist or vet, for instance, they're very clinically focused and, and rightly so, you have to become an, a clinical expert. But often that leadership expertise is somewhat lacking in that training and development. There isn't the time in the curriculum, in the time at university to put in a lot of leadership training. And invariably also, once you get into a management role and a leadership role, that's the time that you need the leadership too. So perhaps not at the first foray, if you like, of your career clinic. So if you are a clinical practitioner, then we would see this very much as now developing those leadership skills in alignment with your clinical expertise so that you can bring your leadership knowledge and, and expertise to a higher level so that then you will become even more and ever more employable in this world of work. Yeah. So this is obviously designed um, the programme for a range of um, leaders, but uh, uh, to the to the highest level so we do expect you to become real kind of leaders um, and make a difference in your organization and beyond that's great thank you i'll just go into a couple of minutes in case any more uh, questions coming through the chat or through the um q a obviously this is a quite a new program um, for the university. I think you mentioned at the beginning, Jenny, about that first cohort currently going through um, things. Mm -hmm. Are there sort of things that have come out of, of um, I suppose, the, the existing cohort that have been quite interesting, exciting to you and to, to them as they've kind of started their journey with us, obviously mm -hmm. back in January now, are the things that you would say of... Yeah. I think Susan and I, we absolutely adored that first meeting with that cohort of students. And we were very, very excited to hear that already it was starting to make changes and make them, um, if you like, consider leadership from a personal perspective and really personalizing the course. They were, they were giving very much a personalized view, weren't they? Um, and, and the fact that it was such an eclectic mix on where they were from in the world about their backgrounds and obviously we can't give away kind of student confidentiality but one student really stood out who had been born in one continent then moved to a different continent and now finds themselves in yet a different continent still and just the way that that development of that individual has occurred and is occurring now and the influence they're bringing to their region within their new country they're in. Absolutely amazing. We hear of these people, but actually to physically meet one and then hear about them going on our course and starting to understand the difference that, that could make to that region of healthcare. I found it absolutely wonderful. Really, really wonderful. It brings it to life for us, doesn't it, Susan? After all our hard work to design to take it to that level. Yeah, certainly. And also I think the range of professionals that are on the programme, um, a huge range of clinical and non-clinical, all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, could be vets, doctors, um, nurses, um, people working in other services aligned to healthcare, um, all over, you know, UK-based, 
um, and also all, all around the world. So I think it's a re really nice programme from that perspective in terms of really sharing practice and also having an understanding of different organisations because I think that's really important because we can learn from, each of us can learn from each other's uh, problems and how we solve them um, and uh, the skills that are required. That's true. And also it's enabling us not to be introspective and looking at th things from our own angle. So if in the UK, for instance, we were looking at the NHS, we might see things from an NHS angle. Um, but that's only one part of healthcare in, in a world vista. So I think there's an important angle that we're going to learn or you're going to learn from different types and different people across the world. And that might help you improve the very system that you're sitting in. But often it's hard to change a system when you're not aware of, of systems outside. So I think that's a key component of the role too, of the course, yeah. That's great, thank you. I can't see any more questions coming in now. I'll just give it another sort of 30 seconds or so if anyone does have any questions, the, the chat or, or the Q&A, just to see if there's any last questions coming through. Okay, I think might be everything. So I'll probably say at this point, thank you to everyone uh, for attending today. And thank you, of course, to all of the, the presenters. And a recording of this webinar will be made available to everyone who registered for this event today. So we'll be sending that recording out probably at some point um, next week. If you do have any questions that you've perhaps not thought of um, to ask in this session, then please do contact the team, the admissions team via our website. And obviously they'll be able to, to respond to those questions. We've got the live chat on the site. We've got the contact form and also an email address and a telephone number. So please do get in touch if there's anything that you um, would like to know about the programme after the, the, this session. So obviously we hope to welcome you onto the programme very soon. And I know you said something might be nice to finish just to be able to see um, the attendees, for us to be able to sort of see each other. Um, so what I can do at this point to allow that to happen is to promote attendees to panellists to allow you to turn on your camera just to be able to see each other to, to say goodbye at the end of, of, of this webinar today but the recording is continuing so if you do not want to be seen didn't want to do this you're welcome to, to leave at, th at this point now um, from the session but I will just try to do this it might not work but I'll see if I can end the session um, and share the right permission. So I will try to promote you to panellists now, just so we can see all the attendees briefly to say goodbye. But if you don't want to do that, you're welcome to, to, to leave at this point. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yes, thank you, everybody. And if you do have any questions, um, please contact us through the website after this session. I'm happy to answer any more questions that you, that you might have. And also we look forward to seeing some of you on the programme um, very soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.